Hey guys, welcome on into Drinks with Binks. I'm your host, Julie Stewart Binks, and I am so excited to be joined by my friend, uh, an incredible host, broadcaster, Taylor Rooks from Bleacher Report. Thank you so much for coming to drink here on Drinks with Binks today. Oh my gosh, anytime you say drinks, I'm there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, right? It's like a great way to just reel in my guests. Like, we'll, uh, we'll have a little alcohol, and it is early. We are recording this earlier in the morning yeah so um that might influence our drink choices but any time of the day it's okay for a drink <laughs> i mean i might have to take this trick from you like get the interview guests a little drunk i know maybe they'll just say whatever i want like, them to honestly, say. honestly though because i wasn't because i also drink so i'm like okay julie throw to break try to remember your words but <laughs> when we had our first guests on the cooligans who also have a show on fubo tv alexis he had some bourbon and he started telling a story and I just looked at his glass and was like completely empty. I thought, all right, <laughs> this is going to go in a direction I have no idea. Exactly. Yeah. Which is the best direction. Yeah. <laughs> so with Drinks and Thanks, we asked you what you would like to drink today mm -hmm. and what do you want? Classic mimosa. Well, well, yeah. uh, surprise. We actually <laughs> have that ready to go right wow. here. Wow. So if you are you able to grab that? Okay, I perfect. Am. Um, so we have a nice classic mimosa, a little okay. orange juice and Prosecco. Yes. Made by Mike, who did these off camera because he was relegated after just putting egg white all over his face last week. Um, Mike's dead. We already said that. <laughs> uh, but, we have to cheers. Uh, yes, we will yes. cheers in one second. Okay. But let's find out. We like to take our guests on a journey. Where would you like to drink this drink today? My favorite city is Chicago. I actually think I had my first mimosa in Chicago. Wow. So we have History to go. We have it. to go back. Okay, so we are going to do -do -do Chicago. There we are. The nice... Oh, that makes me miss yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. We'll pretend we're there now. Okay, so let's, we will cheers. Uh, these are filled all the way yeah. to the top. Again, thanks, Mike. Hmm. <laughs> You know what? Mike did a pretty good job he did, he for did. not being a great bartender. Yeah, for yeah. not for not for not being a great bartender. Yeah. Not so bad. Uh, but yeah, so we we decided Chicago is where we wanted to go drink today. It's such a beautiful view here, and you that's where you started your career, correct? It is. Okay. Yeah. So I went to the University of Illinois, but my first job was at the Big Ten Network, which is in Chicago and River North area. I just think Chicago they have the best restaurants. It's a big city, but you still have a homey feel to it, you know, with the river running through it, and everyone's so nice and Midwestern. Um, someone once told me it's like New York without the New Yorkers. Yeah. And I really feel like it is. Without jerks. And yeah. Like smelly <laughs> weirdness everywhere. Yeah, it actually smells really good there. It's clean. Mm -hmm. I've also heard a lot of people tell me it's a lot like Toronto. Yes. I've been to both, and I do think they're really similar. Yeah. Um, so I'm a big Chicago fan. Yeah, and, and I'm a big Toronto fan, so yeah. they're basically brother and sister. <laughs> I've actually kayaked down this, what is this again called? Really? The river? Yeah, the river, whatever. I think it's Chicago River, I think. Yeah, one, yeah. whatever, you know. We're not here One to of talk. those, We're yeah. I just talk. know it's green on St. Patrick's Math Day. Math and science, okay? <laughs> uh, yeah, but yeah, green on St. Patty's Day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is, I don't know how that happens or... I don't know the process what, either, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but it's a lot of fun. Um, but with us having a drink, uh, also would like to toast to... Oh, first of all, I don't think we cheers or... Did we, I don't know. We I guess I'm already up. Yeah. <laughs> That's that CT setting in right now. Um, <laughs> it's so what? Um, what would you like to toast to today? Like what's uh, what's good going on in your life that you're excited about? Oh, I don't know. Um, you know what? I'm going to toast to the Falcon season getting better. That's at oh. least my hope. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, that. Well, good luck to the Falcons. Thank you. Let's toast to that getting better. <laughs> yeah, so you are you're a big Falcons fan. Is that like Huge. your your number one team? That's the only team I root for. Oh, okay. I don't have an allegiance to any other team except the Falcons. Like, I mean, I want the Hawks to do well, sure, but I'm not like it doesn't really matter to me if they win or lose, but I really get upset if the Falcons aren't okay, doing well. Okay, so where did that passion come from? Well, I'm from Georgia. Right. So I lived in Georgia since I was six until I went off to college. So just that's just always been the thing. I mean, especially I was growing up when Michael Vick was there and he was like mm -hmm. the savior of Atlanta, you know. So I've just always had a very deep tie to the Falcons right. and wanting them to do well and so many good memories at the Georgia Dome. And so that's, that's my team. What's like your favorite memory of just – being Atlanta Falcons fan. Oh, you question. know there's some not so good ones recently. But, yeah, there's uh, there's definitely up, some not so good ones. Fan. I mean, I think like 
and you know say what you will about Michael Vick I think that's really what I think about when I think of the Falcons is like just simply going to the dome and watching him and mm. a lot of times when you talk about quarterbacks like you don't People always talk about the black quarterback. But to me, growing up, my quarterback was black, and I never thought it was weird. That was just my quarterback. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't until later that I was like, oh, I guess it was weird that he was black. You know what I mean? So when people talk about representation and stuff, that's why I think the Atlanta Falcons have meant a lot to people that are my age and a little older because right. it was very indicative of what the city was actually like. Mm -hmm. um, so I just think the Falcons have become like a cultural symbol right. to the city and I think to a lot of other places. Um, so I think that's just what I think of when I think of the Falcons. And then, but that hasn't sort of been the same for other teams in the city then. It's yeah, I wouldn't, yeah, I'd say no, but I mean, I was also growing up there when like Chipper Jones was good and baseball was really good, mm -hmm. you know? So I've seen a lot of, you know, the highs of Atlanta sports, but the Falcons just what really sticks out to me because I'm a football girl. I like basketball a lot. They're definitely 1A and 1B, but we're a football family yeah well i was you know doing some research because i i do my job uh sometimes <laughs> and just notice i didn't realize just mm -hmm. the family connections that you have within football with your father yeah and then also your uncle yeah and then also in baseball with your uncle as well right mm -hmm. yeah um and so not I'm, a big baseball fan but yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> even though your uncle's a hall of famer yeah i love the cardinals but like baseball i'm like eh. I get it. I get it. I think it's a lot yes. of fun. Yeah, Lou Brock is yeah. is your your uncle who was a Hall of Famer. Yeah, that's impressive. And then Marv Woodson. Yeah, also mm -hmm. for the Saints and it's, Steelers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I find that fascinating. We're gonna talk more about this uh, in a second, but uh, mm -hmm. obviously you have so many connections within mm -hmm. the NBA world and yeah. beyond. But you are a football family. Easy. It's yeah. uh, a lot of different. Uh, mm -hmm. Lots of different pies being baked. I'm really not good with these different analogies. <laughs> that works pies though. being baked. That worked though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we got to take a quick time out, but we'll be back with a whole lot more, whole many more drinks with Banks after this. Welcome on back to Drinks with Binks. I'm JSB. We've got Taylor Rooks from Bleacher Report here with us today. And we were just discussing your background growing up as a football fan first. And a lot of that probably maybe you can tell me having to do with your family having such great careers within that. What was sort of like your first memory, uh, especially seeing your dad and your uncle playing football that really made you think like, wow, this is really exciting? Yeah. You know, so my dad was a running back at University of Illinois. Um, he was one of their best running backs. So I would always grow up hearing like his time in Champaign and his time as Fighting Illini, and we'd go back. And so sometimes when we would be back on campus, we'd go to the games, and I would just feel like the passion and how electric it was, Memorial Stadium, and everyone coming up to him and talking about his run against Ohio State, which is apparently like some really big deal there. I understand it now. <laughs> uh, at the time, I didn't. But it was really just going back and seeing that college football environment that really made me fall in love with the game. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, as much as my dad is a football fan, my family is a football fan, really my mom. Oh. My mom is a huge football fan. I mean, she's like the best ever at fantasy football. She's a big, big fan. So growing up, it was really everybody. My sister goes to UGA and she is okay. like die hard bulldog, which everyone in Georgia is. But so yeah, it's it's more than even just the ones that played. We all like live, breathe, eat football. And I'm Southern and yeah. we care about that down there way more than we care about basketball. Yeah, and, and now especially coming to New York, it's yeah. like sort of the other side. You then you've worked at SNY before going to Bleacher Report, and that's not necessarily college football. That's sort of yeah. more college or hoops. college in general. You yeah, think they like college hoops. Um, only UConn. Yeah, only yeah. You know, mm -hmm. especially yeah, UConn women's. Yeah, for sure. So. And that was a change too. Like I'm used to people really loving college sports. Mm -hmm. Here they're kind of like give or take. Like they want it to work, but they're like, ah, oh, I don't really care. I'd rather the Giants and Jets and Mets and Yankees right. do well than I would like St. John's or whatever. So that was an adjustment. But um, it's just it's interesting 
where like depending on where you are, the oh, things yeah. that they really care about. Yeah, and then you sort of start to um, like it permeates into what you're interested in and and yeah. what you decide to sort of get involved in. I lived in England for a while, did my master's there, and was like, oh, okay, that's where I really got into soccer. It's because yeah. you're you're around it all the time, and everyone's obsessed with it, kind of like that tribal nature you mentioned sure. with, with college football. Which then for here would be, you know. Um, Yankees, Giants, mm -hmm. Knicks. Yeah. I mean, which I'm sorry. It's a little bit yeah. tough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you like England? Oh my God. Yeah. I loved yeah. it. Like I said, I I just did an interview where I was like, if I had to live anywhere, I, like I would want to live in London again because it really? was, it's so much fun. Like it, it reminds me of New York and also then Toronto. I like the cities where everyone's just so everyone's just it, I guess the saying I think it was Winston Churchill it's like um, if you're tired of London you're tired of life and oh I love that yeah that's kind of like New York in a yeah. way but tell me um, you're back in, you, when you're in New York mm -hmm. you, you work with SNY but you decided to do more of like a NBA basketball focus like yeah. rather than the football where did that transition and that interest sort of start from so you know I think that the NBA is just so good at marketing their players. Like with NBA players, you kind of feel like you know them. And there's this really, really big interest in almost all NBA players. Whereas in the NFL, people kind of only care about the stars. Right. You know, you know a little bit about every player that at least starts or every player that's on a team, even if it's one thing. Just because, I mean, a lot of that has to do also with it. They don't wear helmets. You know what mm -hmm. they look like. Yes. They're really good on social media, things like that. But... And then being with Turner, it's already so like NBA focused. And yeah. there's a lot of really good stories in the NBA. So the show, I think, was, I'd say over 50% NBA players last mm -hmm. year. We had one football player, one soccer player, one WNBA player. Right. But I just think there's always so many storylines and so much like drama and things happening in, in the NBA that it is served well for, for the audience. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. for sure. And I, I want to talk. Um, a lot more about your show in a second but when when you were with SNY that's sort of where you started the show yeah in a way mm -hmm. um who was sort of your first interview and how did the idea come to fruition where you thought hey this can be a yeah. real nice tangent for me yeah so I started it's funny the time out with Taylor Rooks podcast I started this summer before I committed to going to SNY I was like living with my then boyfriend and I was so bored. And I'm like, I need to do something. Cause you know when you're not on air, you just yeah. feel like you're forgotten about and you're doing nothing. And that's how I felt. I'm like, I'm gonna do a podcast. I'm just gonna interview people, whatever. So my first interview for that was with Tyrod Taylor. Mm. And we talked for like an hour. I didn't record it correctly. So the whole oh. podcast was gone. Luckily I called him, I explained what happened. He was like, we could just do it again. Oh, that's like, so he was so nice about the whole thing. So I redid this podcast with Tyrod Taylor, and then my second interview was Snoop Dogg, and it was really good. And then I took the job with SNY, so I had to take a bit of a break to bring it to them. Mm -hmm. And then my first interview, once I got to New York, was with Victor Cruz. Um, and so that kind of relaunched doing it in New York, and the guests got bigger yeah. and things like that. So it was definitely a process in the beginning, but SNY, I'm so appreciative. They really got on board with it. They supported me giving me the studio and giving me camera operators and all that good stuff and um it was nice you know being able to have these people come into the studio and create this thing it really is like my baby yeah. like my thing has always been just talking to people and interviewing them that's what i've always loved and i really wouldn't be able to have the show i have now if it wasn't for that podcast definitely so i'm super thankful to them for that and i mean one thing that we can't forget is that you had tyrod taylor and snoop dogg on this podcast before you were even with a network, yeah. I mean, you've been you have been so incredible with getting oh, thank you. huge names thank you. that no one else can. And I want to get into that even more, but how you get them to open up so mm -hmm. well and, and break news and they feel so comfortable around you. But even just at the beginning, how were you able to get big names? Yeah. So a lot of it, I credit so much to just like A, social media and B, being invited to certain things mm -hmm. you know like the reason i was able to stay in contact with snoop dogg is i did sideline for this charity game they did for flint so i was with him all day interviewing him doing the interviews like he was coaching a team and we were just cool after that and so when i said i want to do the podcast he's like yes you did this charity game i'm gonna do your podcast you know right. tyrod taylor just 
followed me on Twitter and I DM'd him and was like, hey, I'm really, I want to start this podcast. You'd be a great guest. And one thing I've learned is like people do really like to talk about themselves. Yeah. You know, whether they admit it or not, people like having that kind of like attention on them, getting them to say like whatever it is they want to portray to the world, right? And it was at a time where like Tyrod, was in an in-between phase determining the contract. So he was like, sure. I think half of it is they also were like, no one is going to hear this. And they were right in the beginning. You know, no (laughs) one was listening to it. So, but it was good because what I've learned is getting the guests after that is being able to say, well, I interviewed Tyrod and Snoop Dogg and Victor Cruz. People were like, oh, okay, this is legit. I'll do it. So every guest really helps you get the next guest. Um, And that's why I'm super thankful to everybody that has ever come on the podcast. Because, like, you don't have to give your time to someone. And they give a lot of their time. When we did the show, we're with them for, like, three hours, you know? So um, it's it's certainly been really special. Yeah, well, that's what I plan on doing. I'm like, hey, Taylor Rooks came on our show. (laughs) She dedicated all this time to helping me out. I think you guys should as well. I (laughs) want to get into more on that. But we got to take a quick break on Drinks with Thanks. We'll be back with Taylor Rooks. Don't go anywhere. Hey, welcome on back. We are drinking and banking here on Drinks with Binks. I'm Julie Stewart Binks. We got Taylor Rooks from Bleach Report, Turner. I didn't mention that. They're all part of the same family and we were discussing your guests but more importantly in the commercial break we just found out that you your first job was at (laughs) chick-fil-a yes chick-fil-a was my very first how was that great it was good you know i feel like i'm super cheery and everyone at chick-fil-a is very cheery and everyone asked like did you say my pleasure and i don't understand you have to say my pleasure. <laughs> you really go through like a training process and they talk to you about saying my pleasure. Like it's, and there was three interviews, like the rounds it's, of interviews to work there. Yeah. Oh my yeah. Gosh. But it was my first job. I'm, I'm thankful for it. It was fun. That's was incredible. Fun. Then for your first job, three interviews, first interviews you'd ever done before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it was my first one. Yeah. I didn't think about it like that, but yeah, I did three interviews and I got it. What would surprise us about working at Chick-fil-A? Okay, it's probably something in the kitchen, but like I didn't work in the kitchen. Yeah. I was like a hostess and I did the drive through and I was very fast on the drive through. <laughs> well, that's most important. Yes, yeah, so I was very fast on the drive through. Um, probably that they have to accommodate whatever it is you ask for. Like if you have a crazy order and it's like, okay, I want this, but know this and add this from that thing, like they have to do it. Really? They have to make it work. Yeah, like so now when I go to get a milkshake, I say, <laughs> Can I have the cookies and cream milkshake with a splash of strawberry? Because like they have to add some strawberry in there. Like they won't charge you extra. Know just that, like, I think. Yeah, they have to do like, whatever. Yeah, we can't. No. Yeah. You always say yes. Yeah. Or if it's you know breakfast and you want chicken minis, but you just want the bread, you can say that. Like I just want the chicken minis bread, and they have to do it. <sighs> Yeah. Okay, well, that's going to change up some <laughs> orders going forward. How right. much Chick-fil-A did you eat? A lot. Yeah. Because you got it, like, 50% off. Mm. You know, it was it was a lot. Like, I love the Honey Roast Barbecue Sauce. Very slept-on sauce, by the way. Honey Roast Barbecue Sauce, you okay. should get on your sandwiches. Try that. You know, yes. I just I just had Chick-fil-A, like, a, literally a year ago. First time. Love it? Yeah, I loved it. I mean, yeah. I had never, and I, I had it when I was in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, which I felt like, I was like, I'm American now. <laughs> like, I did the damn Why thing. Why were you in Hattiesburg? <laughs> <laughs> so I Most like, importantly. Oh, where do I want to go? Oh, I'm going to go right there. No, I did, uh, I did a Southern Mississippi State game. Oh, great. Okay. Yes, uh, against Marshall last year, which was a lot of fun. Yeah. But my first job was at actually a company that you guys don't have here in America, New York Fries. Okay. Ironically, New York fries in Canada. <laughs> also, Boston Pizza, Canadian company. Don't ask me why. But I get the world of, like, the cashier, the yeah. fries. Like. You know what I didn't know? I was talking to a friend of mine. His name is Boy Wanda. He's from Toronto. And we were talking about the Popeye's chicken sandwich. Mm. And he said, we don't have that in Canada. And I didn't know that, like, things had to clear. You know, like, yeah. I thought every Popeye's would get it. Just like, all, oh, yeah. 
You know? Oh, Canada He's like, no, we're very zero. strict for like the health stuff. I'm like, wow, I didn't know that. Just everything, like growing up, America had everything. It was like, yeah. you guys had better gum. You had just more selection. <laughs> like just yeah. go into a CVS, you're like, oh my gosh, wow, they have all these random things that just we didn't have. And even yeah. Netflix, like Canadian Netflix isn't as good as American Netflix. Really? Everything's like America light. I know that's like kind of sucks. I'm sorry to canadians but like we just don't have but then ketchup chips all dress chips tim hortons is literally it but <laughs> you you spent some time in toronto last I did, year i did i did the raptors yeah and i feel like we are on the same team for this one because uh you have a lot of contacts within the raptors organization yeah and you did such a good interview with demar de rosen thank on you your show, Take thank it you taylor rooks and for all of us like it was kind of the first time we really saw him talk about being mm -hmm. traded and i mean there's so many different avenues to go with this like your interview style gets people to really open up mm -hmm. and be themselves as we said people feel comfortable and with him he just like told you everything thank you were you surprised like how did you kind of get that out of him yeah i mean i would say that's probably the interview that i was the most proud of of last season you know like when i Look at the people that we had on. I knew them to some degree. Like, you know, Saquon is a good friend of mine. I'd interviewed Jimmy on the podcast. Mm -hmm. I met Dame years ago. I didn't know DeMar. So I come in there and I, like, had to make him feel really comfortable. And I always say, like, the first, like, 10 minutes before you start the interview are, like, the most crucial. Mm -hmm. And I look at everyone and I say, like, this is your time to say what it is that you want to say and let people know how you feel. Like, there's a lot of conflicting ideas of, like, what happened and who you are. But, like, you can tell you can tell people now. I say that every time so people understand, like, mm. that's what you can do here on the you show. control over it. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And, like, it helps them. It helps me. But I think the thing with Damar is, like, that was somebody who understood that like the narrative about him wasn't what he wanted it to be and there were so many times where he was just like you know I've never said this before but I'm just gonna tell you because he was like, like I'm yes, yeah go ahead come me. on <laughs> yeah I think he was just tired of like his piece not being out mm -hmm. there um but I've also found people have told me that like they feel like they can say whatever because I feel like I'm a super open book mm -hmm. and sometimes when you're interviewing with somebody that you feel like has something to hide or super standoffish or not like sharing with their time are like whatever's going on with them, it makes you more wary of them. Right. But I think my biggest thing, and I've always said this, is they kind of see me as a peer. Right. Like I'm their age, they've seen me for a while, they've seen the work for a while, they know someone who knows me, you know, something like that. And it's a lot easier when you're talking to someone that you view as a peer or a friend right. as like your counterpart. Um, and so that that absolutely helps as well. They feel familiar, I'd say. Right. Is there is there anything even just like with your line of questioning or the way you approach topics that you find is sort of the key, even though, you know, they're comfortable. They know that this is their time to shine. But sort of moments that you use as I know how to sort of. Yeah. Do open heart surgery on this in a way. For sure. I mean, sometimes it's like so, for example, I put a clip on Instagram of the DeMar interview. And it's when I say to him, so what do you say to people that are saying, okay, they only got here because Kawhi, they couldn't get here without Damar. There are some comments that were like, that's so rude to ask him, why would you ask him that? But I'm like, no, like that's the point of the interview. Isn't that yeah. what you wanna know? <laughs> yeah. But it helps that I'm saying, this is what people are saying. Right. You know, I didn't say, the Raptors could only get there with Kawhi and not you. Right. It's like, no, yeah. this is the narrative. This is what people are saying. Mm -hmm. And I think that helps and they wanna answer that. Or like Jimmy Butler, I was like, people think you're a bully. Yeah. Are you a bully? You know, like when you I think when you frame things as like this is the overarching idea, they are kind of a bit more open. I also seriously I talk to everyone like they're my friend. So like and there's ways to ask questions that don't seem like you're attacking or judging. It's just if all your questions come from a place of understanding, okay. I think it's it's easier for people to to open up like everyone who interviews Saquon always says like, He's very by the book. He doesn't really say anything. He's super humble. But, like, I just leaned into him being humble. It's like, mm -hmm. you're super humble. Why won't you say blah, blah, blah? Like, people think that that's a hindrance. But I think that's it's really good to actually know that personality trait of someone before you go into an interview. Right. Um, and not shy away from that, if that makes sense. No, no, definitely. Yeah. What? So when you say, like, you know, like, there's, there's certain just phrases, words. Like, if you wanted me to open up, 
Yeah. Like, what would you, how would you approach that? Well, I'd get you drunk. I, well, well, we're here. Yeah. We did it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I think something interviewers don't do enough, and I try to do is say, like, what do you want to talk about? You know, and I probably, like, a- ask you what you want to talk about. I'd find out that thing that, like, gets you going. Like, right. what, what that passion is for you. Um, and I think you're a person who you thrive in an environment that's more relaxed and more fun. Like, I don't think you're a person who would open up in an environment that felt stuffy. Right. Yeah. Cause like nothing you do indicates that like yeah. your show is like on couches and drinks and I gave it away, you know? Yeah. So <laughs> something like that, I think for you, it's less of the environment you're in and more of like the feel of the environment gotcha. that you're in, you know? Um, so I think on it, but that's what comes to mind. Yeah, first. just just making people feel comfortable. And yeah. Before we take uh, a time out, I I do want to ask you more about Demar. Like, we saw him really open up, but what was he like as a person, even when the cameras weren't on him? When yeah. you were trying to get him to sort of feel comfortable, mm-hmm. what was the vibe you got about what he was even carrying for the year? Yeah, I mean, in all honesty, like he just seemed very at peace. Like, he just seemed like, I'm happy for my friend Kyle. This is my situation now, and I'm making the best of the situation that I'm in now. Like, a lot of times I'll interview someone when the cameras are off, sometimes what they said is a lot different than how they were when the camera was on. But he kept the same thoughts and that same energy throughout the entire thing. It wasn't like, oh, but I hate the Raptors. It was like, no, like, I know they're only there because of me. That's what I said in the interview. That's what I'm sticking by, but I'm happy for them. Good for them. He was really nice. He was really thoughtful. You could tell, like, everyone in L.A. just, like, loved him. The shoe store he went to, they were so happy to see him. Um, He was a really, really nice human being for sure. Yeah, well, it was tough for people in Toronto. Like, I remember when he was traded, we were all kind of like, man, he was the heart and soul of, like, this team and this country and him and Kyle together. It was sad, and but then from like another NBA perspective, you're like, well, Kawhi Leonard's one of the best players in the yeah. league. Like he takes it to a completely different level, and so you have to like respect that. And then Kawhi became, you know, the king of the North and all this. And yeah. you have to think as tomorrow, mm-hmm. you're watching your ex date someone awesome and yeah, and go get married, and you're like, well, but I did all this stuff yeah. for you. Uh, so. And isn't that life? I hate that. I'm like, I know. Uh, whoever ends up with my ex, you're welcome. <laughs> I know, because I got you there. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it is very true. All right, we got to take time out. We're gonna be back. Whole lot more NBA and Taylor Rooks here on Drinks and Thanks. Welcome on back to Drinks with Binks. I'm JSB. We've got Taylor Rooks from Turner Bleacher Report here with us today. And I found it interesting what you'd said, um, just tracking back, we were talking about your interview style and with Damar and Jimmy and all these guys, how you ask them what they want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to ask you, (laughs) I'm taking notes. I'm writing it all down here, how to interview better. But I want to ask you what you want to talk about. But then in the same regard, I still do want to talk about NBA. So <laughs> I'm going to blow past that stop sign. All right. Let's... <laughs> if I was a better interviewer, no. Um, but yeah, what would you, what, like when you, it's like today, it's, we're, you know, we're pre-taping this. It's not live. But what do you feel like you want to discuss? Whew, that's a good, I mean, I didn't really think about it, Julie. I should have warmed you up as you yeah. would have. Like, what's, uh. What's sort of on your mind these days? Honestly, I have been thinking about how it is so silly that some people don't think aliens are real. I have been wow. thinking about that. <laughs> Last <laughs> night I was dream. doing like a YouTube deep dive on this. And it's so crazy and so self-centered and so like American to think we're the only people that have ever existed. And so okay. I've been thinking about that recently. I do believe that. Yeah, yeah there's absolutely American aliens. way of life. But what makes you think they're aliens? Well, just like the numbers game. Okay. Like there's like a trillion galaxies. Mm-hmm. So to think that like of the trillion galaxies, this one galaxy has one planet of people is like crazy. No, it is true. It's it 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 can't be. Uh, it can't be. Yeah. It has to be more out there. Absolutely, like it's way more likely that there is and that there isn't. Like astronomically more likely that there so is. So, what made you start thinking about this? 
I honestly don't remember. I was looking on YouTube, and you know the videos come up on the side. No, it was I was looking for like good YouTubers because I like to see like people that create content and yes. stuff. And there was this guy, I cannot remember his name, but what he does is answer questions on all of his YouTube videos. And the example they gave was him talking about the likelihood of there being aliens. And he brought in like math into it and like the different theories about it. And so then I was like, this is so true. And then I just started looking it up. It's, it's a deep, dark rabbit hole. Down yes, there. but so there are so aliens. What do you imagine the aliens to be like? I don't know. I think what has really messed us up is that we base aliens off what we see in movies. Like we think mm -hmm. they're gooey and slimy and like scary. They could look just like us or they that couldn't. Would be weird. Yeah, or their life could be like little things like this, like just because we look this way. And who says they even need oxygen? Like everyone's argument is like, but there's no place that can have air and water, but like we need air and water. Maybe they don't need air and like water. Fish don't need yeah. air. Yeah. So My just things like that. <laughs> So I seriously, I have recently been thinking about that a lot. It's interesting because I, one of my friends, and she's been public about this now, so I can say it, but she works like on UFO mm -hmm. sightings and like what's going on and, and all this. And and we were talking about it with Pau Gasol actually, because he mm -hmm. was like, I do believe in UFOs and because of the numbers game and like there's got to be something else yeah. out there and like what are some of these these objects flying in space like we don't know everything mm -hmm. so I, that's what's the hardest part it's like we just don't know yeah um, like if this entire room was like the infinite space whatever we are like a speck on the mic okay. like literally a little speck so for this, like, this is the only spec that just, that's crazy Yeah, that talk. can't be real. Yeah, that can't it's be right. Be yes. Yeah, it, it, especially if you're looking up at the stars, if you're not in New York City and you look up and you th you see shooting stars, you see planets, you're like, wow. Yeah. We are, we are pretty small. This is I how me and Michael Beasley started talking about the brain. Is it? <laughs> no, not exactly, but this is how you get on a wild tangent like that. I but. love that. I <laughs> definitely didn't expect when I said, what are you on your mind? Like, what do you want to talk about? I didn't think it would be aliens. It's been the main thing on my mind recently. Like a lot? Uh, like, does it cons how much does it consume? Well, you? last night I was like, doing a deep dive for maybe two hours or so. But then I was like looking at some books to talk about it, so I ordered some things on Amazon. Good. I'm a big Amazon person. I love ordering things on Amazon. People talk about going to Target and then walking around with it a lot. I will go on Amazon and it's check. It's so easy. It's so, so easy. What, what books did you and get? And it comes the next day. I'll have to sh look on my phone and, and, show, and show them to you. But I started thinking about not just like um, aliens, but just civilization in general. Mm. So I, the one I remember buying was Homo Deus. I think is how you say it. Is um, it's you all Noah's book. It's the second book to Sapiens. Okay, just about how like eventually this human species is actually going to be technology. Ooh. Like there will be a time that we don't exist because every species that existed has been wiped out. You know, so like and the next thing could just be this like super human mm -hmm. that might not even be like a real human. <laughs> Jeez, sounds like we're having. Yeah. Drugs with thinks <laughs> today on the show. But no, it is fascinating. Yeah. Um, do you I mean, I got it. I do have to take a time out, but I'm, I'm fascinated <laughs> with, like where this comes from, if it's just aliens or if you start thinking about something and you're like, I need to do this deep dive and learn, which is good because yeah. we I don't think we're necessarily as curious as we should be because we have no attention spans anymore. Mm -hmm due to social media boy everyone's probably stopped watching 20 seconds into the show but if you're still here we're gonna be back <laughs> after the break on drinks with things Welcome on back, Drinks with Banks with Taylor Rooks here today. And we just took a deep dive into the extraterrestrial world here. Didn't think we'd be doing that, but I am so glad we did. And I think we need to keep updated with you on your findings. You've ordered a couple books. Yes. And looking at some YouTube mm -hmm. channels on this. Uh, I'm sure it's pretty popular because there's, as we said, if you don't think there are aliens out there, you're an idiot. Seriously. Okay. <laughs> Seriously. Seriously. But uh, to transition from aliens to uh, not aliens. Uh, journalism. Journalism. <laughs> um, my producer said, you should just go into Space Jam and Monsters. And that's a great segue, which is perfect. So, JB, thank you. 
Uh, <laughs> but I really did want to ask you, we were just talking about Snoop Dogg. You've, you've interviewed tons of really fascinating people and someone I'm, I am so like excited that I can't believe that, you know, mm -hmm. is Drake. Okay. Or Aubrey, as you. <laughs> oh, know, Drake Aubrey Graham. Yes. <laughs> okay. Tell me, how did you get to know Drake? What's he like? Yeah. No, Drake is super nice, um, super thoughtful. Let's just like a really nice human being. I actually met him in New York um, when he was in New York for a couple of days because he was doing like his concert. But we already like kind of knew each other just because we have so many friends that are the same, and he loves sports, so he's seen the stuff. He was super complimentary of the work. Um, went to a show. We've just kind of been friends ever since. But he's he's exactly what you think he is. Super nice, very caring, very like he's absolutely like a gentleman. That it's just it's just mind blowing. Was there ever any moment that you sort of had to think, wow, this is like one of the most famous musicians in the world? Um, yeah, I I guess so. But I think you know like we're so fortunate to have a job or like we are really around people that do mm -hmm. great things a lot. Um, so I more so think like, oh my God, when I see like Serena, mm. to me, she is just like this person that is untouchable, you know, but no, I mean, Drake is my favorite rapper. Um, I think he's fantastic. I think he will go down as being like one of the best to do it. Um, he is an amazing artist. Um, and so, no, I'm super thankful that we are friends. He's been very good to me. He gave my family tickets in Atlanta when they wanted to see it. Like he's really a, a great human being. So. Toronto has some. I know. Some he's like, he's, he is like Canada. He's Toronto. He's just, yeah. Everyone didn't like him during the playoffs and the finals just because I like that he's got, he, he's this, got a little chip. He's got a little edgy, spicy. Yeah. He's on my team. That's why I like him. Like, yeah, exactly. You know, Every other NBA fan like hates it. I know. Yeah. So he's also like pretty good at basketball. He is. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, what's, I'll get off of this, my Drake little, um, deep dive in a second, but what's something that I would, that I wouldn't know about Drake, like about like, what's he, he like or something that you found hmm, sort of I surprised you or I don't know, maybe that he is good at basketball. I didn't know that he was good at basketball. Um, I don't know if anything really has surprised me about him because he talks a lot about what he's actually like. Okay. Like his, I think his music is super indicative of like what he's like, right. you know what I mean? Um, so I can't, I don't know. I can't think of something that okay. would surprise Well, me. on this show, what we do is like, when we have a guest on, we say they have to bring someone else on after. And so <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm so excited that we're gonna have Drake on this couch. I want Drake to come on my show. He hasn't even come <laughs> on my show. Hey. You're like, take a number, honey, all yeah. right? He'll like gloss over what I ask, you know? He's like, yeah. He'll send like an emoji. Yeah. <laughs> Changes just like the subject entirely. But I mean, I get it. Like when you're at that level, it's like you can't really do everything. <laughs> but it's like, please. Like, you're like we're buddies. Come on. Yeah. Michelle. You mentioned Serena. Who would be first of all someone that who's someone you really want to interview that that seems maybe like a difficult get or is just sort of like on another platform? Uh, I mean, like Serena. Um, luckily, I have met Serena a couple times. She wow. she is best friends with one of my really good friends. So um, La Lala introduced me to her during Met Gala week. So that was really nice. Um, so Serena's definitely one. I would love to interview her. Um, oh, I had a little burp. This alcohol. Yeah, just... um, Randy Moss, I love. Yes. I don't see him as like super otherworldly like I do Serena, but I'd love to interview Randy Moss. Um, he's the greatest. Um, Jerry Rice people, I don't want to talk about it. Um, those two kind of stick out, but Serena has always been my number one. I'd love to interview like Michelle Obama. I yeah. love to interview. That there's also great. there's also people that like I wouldn't interview because I have questions. Like I would love to interview Roger Goodell. You know what I mean? Um, what would you ask Roger Goodell? I would probably ask him. Like, I always wonder, like, these figures, even if they don't agree with the things we say, if they understand why we say it. Like, I would want to know if he understands why we feel as though Kaepernick has been blackballed or if he understands why women feel as though the NFL doesn't care about women. Like, there's, like, these topics, if you if you maybe don't, if you're not completely on that side, you should at least have the conversation. And I think that we should hold, like, leaders of different things accountable to have mm -hmm. the conversation. 
like conversation isn't about swaying you one way or the other, but it is about talking about it. And I don't think that he has had to talk about a lot of stuff. Like putting out a statement isn't talking about no. something, you know? Um, so what, do you, just, what do you, how do you think he would respond to that? Well, I mean, in an interview, that's one of the great things about interviews, like you have to respond. You know, like if someone asks you a question, you have to give an answer. And like no response is a response. Mm -hmm. And like, do you want me to ask you something like that? You don't say anything? Cause that's way worse than you yeah. saying something. You know what I mean? So I think it obviously be like a calculated response, but I feel like the beauty of, of interviews come in the follow-ups, right? you know? So it'd be like whatever he said back to me, which would lead to like the conversation. Why? Like, yeah. How? Yeah. So, and you know, I think that's what I'm pushing myself to do more. Um, is interview people that maybe I don't agree with everything that mm -hmm. they do, or people that maybe aren't universally liked. You know, I think that that's really compelling conversation, and it it like I think makes you better as an interviewer and a journalist and stuff like that. So, I would like to do that a lot more because like we're all human at the end of the day. Like Roger Goodell probably does stuff that we don't like, but he's learning through life as we all are. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what is so beautiful about having conversations because you learn about each right. other through having a conversation. And he would be, as you mentioned, someone that you think maybe potentially, potentially not depending on his answer, yeah. but might not be on the same wavelength as agreeing. Who would be someone, and we have to go to a break in a second, but who would be someone that you would want to interview that you know probably has a different opinion than you? Donald Trump. <laughs> for sure <laughs> I mean that's the one that comes to mind um, yeah that's that's someone I know without a doubt we see the world differently yeah <laughs> and if you had him on this couch here what would you want to ask him <laughs> oh my gosh so much no yeah there's a lot I would probably say I'd probably say something to the effect of like like it's in human nature to disagree on things like I like coffee and you don't, or I like candy and you don't. But it's when whatever you disagree with disrupts whatever my humanity is, is when you have like an issue. So I would ask how it feels to fundamentally, di fundamentally disagree with people of color, um, people of different sexual orientation as you, and make decisions that affect their day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. Like how does that weigh on you that what you're doing disrupts me as a human being? Um, and want him to like have to answer that question as someone who represents the demographic that he doesn't right. always probably represent. And he'd probably just put out a Nickelback video in response. That was insane. To that he did saying that. Saying that. Yeah, it was <laughs> not real life, as you yeah. would say. You would be very. Yeah, you, you would uh, be much more poignant than I'm sure any response he would elicit <laughs> in that. Uh, and on that note, uh, we've got to take a little break here on the show. Much more great goodness coming up after the break. <laughs> Who are those people drinking that drink right there? I don't know. Stock video for the win. Uh, back with drinks with Binks. I'm Julie Stewart Binks. We got Taylor Rooks. Taylor, we were just discussing NBA season is coming up. You're going to be doing stuff for TNT's Twitter yeah. show. What is, I'm like, I have a couple different questions about the NBA season, but what do you think is the most underreported story heading into the season? Ooh, that's a good question. Most underreported story. Something even just that you think that we're not talking a lot about that maybe will come to fruition early. This is kind of an off the court thing. I just think it's interesting. Um, Spencer Dinwiddie of the Brooklyn Nets was for a long time has been talking about how he was going to create this business or this like program where you could essentially buy stock in NBA players and like mm. a share of like their contract was like you you essentially were like a part of the team because you would buy shares of an individual and he would always talk about how it's completely legal blah, blah blah he announced it like three days ago then two days ago the NBA said he couldn't do it oh. um but the whole premise of it is like really really interesting because he's talking about how legal it actually is but they just don't want you to make more money than what your contract allows gotcha. um so I, I would love to hear more about that. I, but see, I think the off the court stuff is just so much more interesting oh, yeah. than like 
whatever happens on the court. So I probably say that. And I also think we haven't paid a lot of attention to uh, Victor Oladipo coming back. Right. Um, because he was like the heart and soul of that team. So I wonder how good uh, the Pacers are going to be. Yeah, they definitely needed him last year. Yeah. You mentioned the Nets. You've interviewed Kevin Durant before. He's he's an enigma for a lot of us that don't know like anything yeah. about this interesting character. Why, based on what you know, why do you think he decided to go to Brooklyn? And how do you think that whole, how do you think it's going to work out with him and Kyrie? Yeah. Going forward. I mean, I think that Kevin is the type of person that he thrives in an environment where he feels as though the people really care about him as a human being. And I do think the Nets accomplished that. Like, him and Kyrie are actually really good friends. I think a lot of people on the Nets just are good friends mm. um, and want the other ones to do well. So I think that he'll thrive just simply off of that. They recognize that the worth they have with Kevin um, and all those and all that good stuff. I think that he ultimately wanted to go there because of that, I think he wanted to feel appreciated. I think he wanted to just go to a spot where it was about winning and like growing as a human. He's very much so into like self growth and things right. like that. Um, and I think he saw that with the Nets. Okay, so then um, I want to talk so much more about this stuff, but the other side, my boy Kawhi left us. <laughs> and I'm not mad, went to the Clippers. We got the whole LeBron versus Kawhi type of weird yeah. LA dynamic. How do you see the West playing out in just sort of like, we don't have too much yeah. time, but what do you think? Ooh, what do I think? You know, I'm going to have to go with LeBron and AD over anything. Like, I think the Lakers will be the team in LA when it all comes down to it. Um, and I don't even really know if it'll be Lakers Clippers in the Western Conference Finals. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, obviously, I think it could be. But I also think sometimes we do sleep on teams like the Blazers. I don't think that the Blazers will come out of the West, but they are very much so battle tested in the West. You know what I mean? Right. Like you there's still this like getting used to the West that has to happen. Um, and Paul George, like, he's kind of used to it, but he has to really become used to it. I also think you can't, the Warriors aren't done just because they don't have Kevin yeah. Durant anymore. Like, they still have Steph Curry, they still have Draymond Green. Clay is going to come back at some point in the right. season. So I don't know, but if it's about the Battle of LA, I'm going to go with the Lakers yeah. over the Clippers. It's, it's hard to bet against them. Uh, last year, yes, but yeah. I find it interesting. You know, so many guys, you mentioned that they're like your peers. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have time to go into this, but it's got to be an interesting relationship in picking the Lakers over someone else or, to, you know, maybe you hear backlash from them like, oh, you didn't say <laughs> me, you didn't do this. Yeah. But uh, but that's the, the role as a journalist. Yeah, for sure. That's the side that you play there. Yeah. Uh, great journalism on my part for not giving you any say in that. We'll take a break <laughs> and we'll be back after this. <laughs> Welcome back to Drinks with Banks. We got to go right now, but quickly, Taylor, where can we, where and when can we see your next season of Take It There? Yes, yeah, so we are going to start taping next year. It will premiere early next year, which is very exciting. I'm excited for season two. Um, but for updates, you can follow me at Taylor Rooks on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, if you still use that kind of thing. Um, that's all at Taylor Rooks. Awesome. <laughs> you are great. Thank you so much for coming here and drinking with us here today. Yes. Chills. And next week, we will have Grant Wall from Sports Illustrated. But until then, keep on drinking and banking. I know we will. Bye. <laughs>